Hello to Germany and hello to the UK. Welcome everybody to the virtual SciCon lecture series. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Christopher Buschel and I am your host today. I'm an assistant professor at Bauhaus Universität Weimar, where I mainly work on issues of financing, reorganizing digital journalism. So first of all, let me start with some words concerning the background of today's gathering. Today's presentation is part of the lecture series, SciCon, Science Journalism in the Digital Age, which is organized by Wissenschaftspressekonferenz. This is the Association of German Science Journalists and the Science Media Center, Germany. And in November, the SciCon conference will take place in Berlin, where we want to discuss what can be done to support science journalism in Germany in the current times of German. And these recommendations will also be informed by the expert lectures we hear today and in the weeks to come. The conference, as well as our online lecture series, are made possible thanks to a grant from Germany's Federal Ministry of Education and Research. All lectures in our series are recorded and transcribed to create a knowledge reservoir as input for the discussions in November. So everyone, please note by participating in our Zoom session, you are agreeing that the lecture, your questions, voice and video will be recorded. Now I would like to proceed as follows. We will first hear a 30 minute lecture. If you, the audience have any thoughts or questions, please don't hesitate to write them in our chat here in Zoom. And after the lecture, we will come back to your questions and we will also have 15 minutes for further Q&A and discussions. So, but now, it's my huge pleasure to introduce to, the, to you today's guest of the virtual SciCon conference, our speaker, Professor Rasmus Kleisnitz. Rasmus Kleisnitz is the director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford. And he is also a professor of political communication in Oxford. Before he joined the Reuters Institute, he received his PhD in communications from Columbia University and taught political communication at Roskilde University in Denmark. Most of Rasmus' research deals with news media organizations and the ongoing digital transformations, changing forms of digital media use in political and news related contexts and also with political communication and campaign practices. His newest book, I have it over here, The Power of Platforms is very well recommended. He published it together with Sarah and Gunter and was released yesterday and it deals with the changing relationships between publishers and the tech giants. Rasmus Kleitz is one of the most distinguished journalism researchers worldwide. And it comes as no surprise that he has won numerous awards, frequently gives presentations at industry conferences such as today. And he's also a member of several advisory boards. Among others, he is the chair of the working group on the sustainability of journalism of the Forum on Information and Democracy. Uh, and they published in 2021 a, a great uh, a great recommendations for governments around the world, a new deal for journalists. And he is the chair uh, of this working group. Rasmus has published widely also on the business of journalism, which will be the topic today. And just on a personal note, a standard text that all of my students have to read in my classes is his chapter on the economic context of journalism from the handbook of journalism studies. I recommend this text to everybody because it's such a polished and pointed way to describe the business of journalism. So I'm sure Rasmus will connect to this work today and uh, he will address in his lecture today, new approaches to journalism's business and business model. So Rasmus Kleis Nielsen, thank you so much for joining us today. 
We are very delighted to have you with us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christopher, for the very kind and generous introduction. And thanks to Holger and everybody else uh, involved in organizing this. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and a, and a privilege to be able to share some of the work that I've been involved in myself and that I have the privilege of working on with many good colleagues, both here at the Institute um, and across the world. So as Christopher said, uh, I've been encouraged to talk about uh, an issue that I think is very important, um, but also perhaps sometimes just uh, a little bit uncomfortable from the point of view of both journalists and uh, and scholars who study journalism if they are not in, in economics or, or business schools, which is the business of news. Uh, I'll show some slides. Uh, it's a mix of some illustrative data points, but also some of the main points that I wanna convey to everyone who's uh, taking the time to join us today. And, and then I look forward to the discussion later on. I want to say at the outset that um, journalism is more than a business. Uh, it's a it's a profession. It, it has a principal set of motivations. It has a wider set of societal uh, roles and 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 responsibilities that go above and beyond uh, what it is as a business. But it is also a business, um, and we should keep front and center as we think about uh, that business and where it might be heading that even in countries with a comparatively generous funding of public service media or in the few countries where nonprofit news are relatively significant parts of the ecosystem, for-profit publishers uh, uh, account for the vast majority of investment in journalism. And because journalism is a vocation, not an avocation, um, it, it, it does require financial investment to practice it uh, in the way in which professional journalists would like to do. And I, I think, therefore, it's really important for us, you know, irrespective of whether we are ourselves directly involved in it, to understand also this business side of journalism, how it's changing and, and where it might be a heading. The second thing I want to say as a sort of a, a opening framing is that um, journalism is uh, a profession that... Um, prides itself on truth telling. And the truth is sometimes hard. Uh, as I've been told uh, in an ad for an American newspaper, the New York Times. Um, but it's also the case that sometimes living without it is harder uh, than uncomfortable and perhaps unwelcome uh, observations about where we are. And I think it's in sort of in that spirit that I will give a, a, a pretty sort of blunt assessment of the way in which I think about the business of news. It is not all doom and gloom, uh, but I think we need to recognize that it's a, it's a challenging environment right now. Um, and a, a lot of these things will uh, not grow easier necessarily for, for some publishers in terms of uh, their business, uh, at least. But again, we should also carry with us that journalism is, is more than the business, even though it's intertwined with it. And uh, we, of course, should never conflate you know, revenues or profits uh, with whether journalism is living up to its own principles or uh, providing society with what citizens hope for from journalists and news media. With that preamble, um, I want to say a few things about where I think we are uh, in the media environment today and with the business of news. Um, and, and then uh, after a section on where I think we are, take a look towards what the sort of defining features of the environment are and where we might be heading uh, in the future. So where are we? Um, the way I think about this is that we are uh, underway in an unfinished media revolution where the starting point for me is the observation that if we think about our fellow citizens as media users, it seems to be the case that almost everyone, almost everywhere who aren't prevented from doing so either by grinding poverty, deep inequality, or lack of infrastructural access or political restrictions, seems to generally prefer digital, mobile, and platform media uh, to print and broadcast the channels uh, that uh, traditional publishers dominated. Um, you know, of course, news was always a relatively small part of a much wider set of things that people use the media for. Um, you know, newspapers in a sense there is a little bit of an, uh, of an exception, but if we think about television as the defining and dominant media form of much of the 20th century uh, and the one that people on average spend by far the most time with, a rough estimate is something like 10, maybe 15% of the time that people spend 
watching television was spent watching uh, news. So, you know, not nothing, but but we, we, we should remember a relatively small part also of this pre-digital media environment. However, in the digital mobile and platform dominated environment that we live in today increasingly, uh, news is an even smaller part uh, of media use online across these uh, digital mobile and, and platform um, environments. Now, this is important for many different reasons, but I mean, most essentially from the point of view of our conversation today, it's because the business of news is primarily based on two things. It is that you sell content to audiences and then you sell those audiences' attention to advertisers. And if there is limited uh, effective demand uh, for the content, small share of attention, there is also then in turn limited attention to sell to the advertisers who of course increasingly have many other ways in which they can try to put their ads or their messages in front of citizens. Um, we should also, I think, recognize that this unfinished media revolution has been underway for some time uh, with significant differences from country to country. Just looking at the consumer choice side of it, um, a couple of things I think we should sort of keep in mind is, first of all, that, uh, again, with variation from country to country, the long structural decline of the daily printed newspaper is nothing new. Uh, neither as a mass medium nor as a channel for advertising. But this chart shows the development uh, from the end of the Second World War till uh, about 10 years ago in the United States over more than half a century in terms of the per capita circulation of paid printed newspapers and then the share of the U.S. advertising market that was spent by advertisers on printed newspaper advertising. And what we see here, of course, is a, an unbroken record of more than half a century of structural decline as people increasingly turn to radio, turn to television, and of course, uh, from the late 90s onwards, turn to digital media. So there's nothing new about the structural decline. It has been compounded, yes, uh, and accelerated in some ways, but actually, uh, as a mass medium, uh, print has been uh, receding for a very long time uh, in, in some markets across the world. Now, um, television for a long time held up much better. It was a different kind of, uh, of experience, a different kind uh, of, of proposition. Of course, it's really only in, in more recent years that, that digital delivery of a television-like experience has really worked. But again, with TV too, we should recognize that the decline is very real and very pronounced already. Uh, I keep being told by television executives that their content is so good that they are somehow sort of exempt from the forces of consumer choice. But just looking here at the UK, you can see how, how really pronounced uh, and even uh, uh, in particular amongst younger group, the structural decline is in terms of the amount of time that people spent uh, viewing television. Um, so you have here a very clear decline uh, in terms of the overall amount of viewing, but a particularly accelerated decline amongst younger viewers who, of course, are often quicker to pick up digital alternatives and haven't been socialized to use television quite the same way that my old generation and, and those who are older were. And in a sense, I think we really need to, to really confront that television is going through a disruption that is as fundamental as that that newspapers experienced in the early 2000s, just a little bit later. So these are the forms that are in structural decline. Which ones are then on the increase? Well, it won't surprise you when I say that these are primarily the platform companies, in particular the largest ones of them. Uh, I've just used here advertising as a sort of illustration of their overall importance in the global media economy. So this is a chart that captures the distribution of global digital advertising revenues across Google, Facebook, and everybody else, literally everybody else. And of course, while things have evolved since with other large platform companies, Amazon, uh, Apple, to some extent, Microsoft, to some extent, TikTok, really pushing for a share of this. The overall pattern here is a highly concentrated one with a lot of advertising going to Google and Facebook and other platforms as advertisers feel they get a return on investment there and choose to move their money. And in a sense, this chart is, is, is only the beginning of understanding how difficult this is for those publishers who historically have been very heavily reliant on advertising revenues because the central thing is that if you look at things like data from eMarketer and you look at the top 10 sellers of digital advertising globally, last time eMarketer published a list, nine of those 10 top 10 sellers of digital advertising were platform companies and none of them were traditional publishers. So it's a very fundamental change where advertisers are going where the audiences are and where they can find cheap, 
targeted uh, advertising at scale. Um, so they're moving their budgets uh, to the platforms. Now, uh, all of this is compounded then uh, by uh, the fact that, that we're really only in the beginning of the generational replacement that will make this change even more pronounced in the years ahead. It is still the case if we break down media use by age that for a, a lot of older uh, uh, fellow citizens, even though people have clearly embraced digital and social media as well, um, for many it is a supplement to lifelong media habits that still tend to center on television and still incorporates for some print. But of course, every time someone dies, it is someone who's watched a lot of TV, maybe read printed newspapers, and every time someone comes of age, it's someone who's grown of, up in an environment that is digital, mobile, and platform dominated. So generation replacement alone will continue to drive this development, even if we imagine a world in which computer scientists and engineers weren't constantly uh, developing uh, new uh, and often compelling uh, digital offerings. Uh, what does this mean? Well, it means uh, that what we are facing here is the end of what I think of as sort of offline revenue subsidizing online journalism. It's worth remembering here that the World Association of News Media, which used to represent newspapers but now uh, has a sort of broader remit, estimates that over 80% of newspaper revenues globally still come from print well into the 21st century. And of course, also to remember that broadcasters are heavily reliant on offline revenues in their business. Um, and in a sense, even after more than 20 years, many newspapers' digital operations are not profitable on their own. They rely on content that is produced for a print product, and they often rely also on the profits generated by the print product. Um, furthermore, of course, many commercial broadcasters are not even really trying to make a profit from the digital news. Uh, it's a byproduct of their wider operations and something that they are effectively subsidizing off of other revenues. And it stands to reason that this cannot go on indefinitely given uh, the, the structural change in consumer behavior and people's preferences, digital news will have to be self-sustaining at some point in the future. And for many, many titles, it just isn't there yet. Now, what does this mean? Um, I, I think we can sort of capture uh, some of the key driving uh, factors in this development, not just the trend lines, but also why things are uh, moving in the direction uh, that I am describing here. Um, the first one is a, a, a very basic, but I think incredibly important point, which is the massively intensified competition for attention enabled by technology. This chart is one I've taken from a piece of work by W. Ross Neumann and a set of colleagues called Tracking the Flow of Information to the Home. And it is what I think of as sort of heroic social science, where scientists try to quantify something that is really difficult to quantify, but, but in, in the process of doing so, I think capture something incredibly important, uh, even if there may be variation in terms of whether this precisely captures every detail of it. What Russ and his uh, colleagues did is that they tried to um, estimate um, for every minute that the average American uh, spent using media, the demand side, um, uh, how many minutes of media content do they have available, the supply side? Um, so if you estimate that, you get a sense of essentially how many options do you have for every minute that you spend. This is what the chart uh, captures over time. In the 1960s, uh, Neumann and his colleagues estimate the average American had access to just shy of 100 minutes of media content for every minute uh, of attention they were willing to commit to media. This grew incrementally over the years. Then you have the development in the sort of mid 80s and, and, and 90s with the explosion of multi-channel television. You have developments in radio that further accelerates this uh, environment. And of course, the emergence of digital media in the late 90s and early 2000s to a situation they estimate in 2005, where the average American had access to almost 900 competing minutes of media content for every minute of attention. That, that is beginning to cease to be a human scale choice. And now what's particularly, I think, important about this chart is that um, to simplify matters and to be able to capture it in a meaningful way in a, in a chart, the, the, the team involved decided to treat the entirety of the internet as one option, so one minute. And in, in, in that sense, of course, uh, the chart really should go towards sort of infinity given the amount of content that people have access to once they have reliable internet access. This is the massively intensified competition for attention that's enabled by technology. And this is a very fundamental shift. 
Uh, we had a media environment as late as when I grew up in the 90s uh, in, on the countryside in Denmark that was characterized by low choice for me as a media user in my village. And as a consequence, high market power for publishers, high market power over me as a media user, but also high market power over advertisers who wanted to buy my attention. That was then. Now we have a media environment that's characterized by high content choice for users and low market power for publishers. I, as a media user, uh, have a lot to choose from. And those who want to buy my attention can buy my attention from lots of different providers, uh, some of them very large with significant market power, but publishers no longer have the kind of market power over me or over advertisers that they had historically. Now, basic economics would suggest that in a highly competitive market, for attention, market prices will, in the absence of effective differentiation, approximate the marginal cost of serving one additional customer. Online, that cost is near zero. Uh, so pay models will be hard, um, not as commercial publishers, lobbyists will often claim primarily because of public service provision, though it, it doesn't necessarily make things easier, but simply because as long as the marginal cost of serving an additional customer is indistinguishable from zero, there will always be a commercial motive for offering news that's free of the point of consumption supported by advertising. And indeed, of course, many commercial providers continue to offer free online news supported by advertising for other models. Now, as if this wasn't challenging enough, what we also see is the unbundling uh, of uh, the traditional publishing proposition and competition from platforms. So publishers primarily benefit from economies of scale and historically from bundling and high barriers to entry. It was difficult and expensive to launch a new newspaper. And those who tried often found at their great cost that they couldn't find a foothold in the market. Today, the economies of scale are still there. But news has been unbundled, we all pick and choose, and the barriers to entry have gone down. It is much cheaper to enter the content business, uh, at least in terms of offering things, than it used to be when you had to secure either printing facilities and distribution or access to the television or radio broadcast networks. Also, publishers now compete with platforms for attention and advertising. And the platform economy is a winner takes most market that's characterized by economies of scale that publishers also know, but also the network effects and data network effects that can be so powerfully self-reinforcing and have led to these sort of huge conglomerates that we've seen in the emergence of with Google and, 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 and the sort of meta uh, portfolio of, of networks. And judging finally from how people spend their time and how advertisers spend their money, we need to recognize however unwelcome this might be from the point of view of many publishers, that audiences, advertisers mostly seem to like this when we look at their revealed preference, what people actually do, where advertisers actually spend their money. So what comes next after this? Um, I think it's clear that what I'm describing here is a challenging environment uh, for the traditional business of news um, and, and one that is uh, far harder to succeed in than the one we had in the past. And again, I, I really want to stress, I recognize that journalism is much more than a business, uh, but it is also a business. And, and I have to sort of sometimes be the one who sort of says the uncomfortable things. So for example, you'll miss us when we are gone. That's not a funding model. Uh, society needs us. It's not a funding model either. Societies and people need lots of different things and they often don't get them. Um, so what might we instead think of as reality-based routes ahead? Um, first, uh, advertising-based models, uh, they will become harder uh, for content producers. They'll become less lucrative for most content producers. Um, and they will require some scale and very low costs. Um, but we should also avoid naturalizing the state of affairs that existed for a period of time in the 20th century and recognize that even if news is a small share of attention, a small share of a very large digital advertising market is still something. And it is still something that will generate uh, some revenues and revenues that in turn are based on investment in original reporting and other forms of content that draw people in so that there is attention to sell to advertisers. So ad-based models will become harder, but uh, still I think will be a factor um, going forward. Secondly, uh, we've seen a big shift towards sort of pay models in particular from newspapers, uh, digital operations, and reader revenue-based models uh, you know, will work for some. 
they require very effective differentiation given the proliferation of free alternatives and a quality product. Quality here in the eye of the beholder, not, uh, you know, it's not enough to win awards. It's nice, but that's not necessarily what people uh, are willing to pay for. So these will work for some, but again, I think we need to be brutally honest and recognize that there is a fair amount of news that's not worth paying for from the point of view of consumers, given how many uh, free alternatives they have, both from commercial and other providers, and how substitutable and commodified a, a lot of the um, content is. Third, um, we can think of journalism as essentially a loss leader, where uh, the uh, entity that invests in the journalism isn't necessarily uh, doing because they want to monetize the content narrowly, but they sell other things around it. They have e-commerce, referrals and the like. They may sell, sell services. Some local publishers offer advertising and PR solutions to local clients. They may be selling tech, um, you know, publishing solutions, for example. And again, there are opportunities here for some publishers and not all, but some. And finally, of course, uh, at least in a sort of Western European countries where we're still fortunate enough to live in sort of stable liberal democracies, the, the sort of public interest argument, or in a narrow sense, the market failure argument, provides the basis for nonprofit or public support. And if targeted, it can be highly effective and will work for some and in some places. And then finally, of course, uh, we need to recognize that there might be other motivations than public interest to make sort of non-commercial investments in, in, uh, in some forms of journalism. So that we just sort of need to keep in mind that across Europe, we have many examples of oligarchs or a form of sort of state capture of the media that is based on providing subsidies that in fact are tools of control uh, where the people who provide the money um, are also the ones who will tell the piper what tunes to play. So um, I will, in, in summary, I'll say, I don't think this is doom and gloom. Uh, I think this is a reality-based view. Uh, and for a profession that prides itself in truth-telling, I think it's also incumbent on journalism to be willing to confront what I think is the truth of the matter in terms of where it itself is as part of the business um, of news. Uh, I think it's tough already. Uh, many of you will, will have personal experience of that. And I think we need to recognize it'll grow tougher for many uh, news businesses in, in the future and that there will be few winners and many losers um, from a business point of view as we move towards that future. But it can be done. I mean, we are seeing, I think, now in a way that's very different from where we were, say, 10 years ago, where there was real questioning of whether this could ever work for anybody. I think we are seeing now both a growing number of legacy off-market newspaper titles that have successfully uh, evolved their uh, editorial and business model uh, to produce real and sustainable growth. Uh, we see... Um, a, a, a small but growing number of digital born publishers uh, across Europe in particular, interestingly, who are building sustainable businesses that are based on investment in quality journalism. And we are, of course, also seeing a whole slew of new forms of reporting and journalism that are sort of quite different from the large standardized mass media uh, that we associate with news publishing and news television in the 20th century. So in closing, I will simply say, I think personally, this is not speaking as a scientist, but personally, that the best journalism we see today is some of the best we've ever had. Uh, I think it is at least as important as it's ever been. Um, and finally, uh, while the business is challenging, I, I also think we should remember that the, while journalism is part of the business of news, journalism is more than the business of news, something subtly different from just being the business of news and how much money it makes is not necessarily uh, the only uh, uh, or, or even indeed a meaningful indicator of its public value. With that, I will stop sharing and I will stop monologuing and I look forward to uh, the questions and to the discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rasmus. Thank you very much for the insightful talk presentation for giving us insights into this unfinished media revolution as you called it um, very interesting uh, very interesting so we already have a question in the chat i will read it and i invite everybody to raise your hand and um i will yeah we already have um your yeah, dam um i will take your question uh, now, but everybody is invited to raise your hand or to write in the chat. So, Georg, please unmute yourself and ask a question. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, thank you for the um, for the excellent talk. You mentioned uh, the, the rise of uh, profitable um, business models, and um, I've um, I've seen um, a lot of very interesting journalism startups, especially in the UK. And um, oftentimes the model seems to be some uh, ex leading personnel from from BBC getting together with um, with with somebody who has a very deep pockets, preferably married into some kind of uh, industrial family or something like that. And uh, following that model, we have seen um, new journalism outlets like Tortoise Media, for example, who have seen very interesting investment and who are investing heavily in, in podcasts, for example. So um, could you maybe talk a little bit about that, why especially the UK seems to be such a great place to uh, to start profitable journalism startups and get investors' money? Um, thank you, uh, George. I can't speak to the um, motivations of specific investors and specific companies where I'm not privy to their, to their thinking around it. And um, I don't remember off the top of my head whether Tortoise is profitable um, on the basis of its journalism. It may be, I just don't know. Uh, what I'll say more broadly is um, I, I think that the English language market is, uh, with a few exceptions, uh, basically one that journalists and publishers everybody everywhere else should ignore when it comes to digital porn startups. Because the uh, the tendency is that a lot of the uh, initiatives that get the greatest attention are in pursuit of global scale. Uh, Semaphore being the the most recent example of this, the with the rather remarkable proposition that people like me are poorly served in a media environment where everyone is you know at my beck and call and wants to serve my every whim. Um, and and of course there are investors who are willing to take a bet on that because they 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 know their economies of scale and if they make ten bets and one of them pay off then maybe it'll be quite lucrative uh, for them. So we've seen that with BuzzFeed, with Vice, uh, we've seen it to in a different way with Vox. Uh, we've seen it uh, with uh, most recently with Semaphore. Now the reason I say that this is something I think is sort of quite different is that. No one in their right mind in France or Spain uh, would go to an investor and say, you know, three years from now, we'll have 100 million users. Uh, that's never going to work. And that idea of sort of hockey stick growth is just on the face of it completely implausible. Um, it may be implausible in lots of different settings, but it's particularly implausible in, in smaller markets defined by language. Now, I actually think this has been an advantage in some ways. Um, I personally think that some of the most interesting and inspiring examples of digital born uh, news media have emerged across Europe and parts of Asia and Africa and, and who have never chased scale. And they've always been based on a very clear editorial identity where they try to do a limited number of things well, not provide everything for everybody. And where they, while they often incorporate advertising as part of their business model, very focused on serving a subset of the public uh, in a way that is demonstrably valuable for them. These are titles such as Mediapart in France, uh, which has uh, grown and grown and grown since it was launched, um, which is essentially is a digital newspaper. It's exclusive content and you pay to read it. Um, it is, uh, these are titles like, of course, The Correspondent in the Netherlands is very successful in the domestic market, though they failed in their English language uh, enterprise. Uh, El Diario in Spain, and beyond Europe, Malaysia Kini in Malaysia and the Daily Maverick in South Africa are other examples of this model. I think they're far more interesting um, than the American or, or indeed UK-based moonshots. There are examples in the UK of, of new publishers who try to have a sort of similarly clearly defined uh, uh, goal, the Manchester Mill uh, are, and a couple of other very locally oriented titles. Um, and... I think that their definition of success is very different from that of, of far more sort of um, um, uh, investor-backed uh, outfits in the sense that they are things that a, that a sort of uh, investor might think of as lifestyle businesses. They, they are not so very different from someone who really cares about Thai food and wants to make a living serving great Thai food for a community and sets up a small business and does this for a living, maybe with a handful or a dozen uh, employees but never someone who would go to an investor and say, if you give me $100 million, you know, you'll be richer than God uh, uh, 10 years from now. It's very different. Um, and I think there is a lot of potential in that model. As you say, many of them are, are launched by experienced journalists uh, who have left legacy media uh, in part because they, they feel by now the cost cutting had got to a point where they'd rather do something on their own. 
um, than be part of groups um, that that continue to try to sort of cut their way to success. Uh, is a follow-up question allowed? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, okay, great. So, uh, what would you say is the um, the special source of these um, successful? regional let's call them regional and local regional media in in spain and france for example is it uh the, the cultural sensitivity so that they can um cover the news from a certain perspective because that is something that basically every traditional newspaper can also do so what is it that in your impression and uh, your observation makes these um digital newcomers so successful in their respective markets um, I think a, a lot of different factors, uh, so a very clear editorial identity that sets them apart from their legacy competitors, as you say, it is suicidal to go up against legacy newspapers and broadcasters as a general news provision, you know, they have more resources, they have brand recognition, they have loyal audiences, why would you try to compete them at their own game? So very clear editorial identity, it can be based on lots of different things, if you take Media Part in France, for example, the proposition of the people involved was that um, even otherwise, in some ways, quite uh, admirable French newspapers, Le Monde, Le Figaro and the like, are not very committed to investigative journalism and tend to be a little bit more sort of just daily news reporting combined with opinion and analysis. Media part said we're going to do investigative journalism. And furthermore, they said that in a, me in a French media market where almost every national newspaper is owned by an oligarch and is heavily reliant on state subsidies, that they didn't want to take any investments from big oligarchs and they didn't want to take any subsidies from the state. It gives them a very clear identity. And then, of, of course, a lot of other things have to be done to make it work. They have to run a lean operation. Uh, they, they have to um, handle all the challenges around digital distribution that everybody else faces as well. They have to uh, keep calm and carry on as reader revenues grow much more slowly um, than the sort of empty reach of, of scale-based models uh, could could give one hope to to do, but again, the fact that 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 this is hard doesn't mean it's impossible. And I think by now we have a critical mass of proofs of uh, of concept, um, and and I think they are some of the most interesting uh, news organizations around. And, and frankly, a lot of legacy media are trying to develop in that direction. But of course, the hard thing is. That if the core of your business and the core of your loyal audience is premised on what you did in the in the 20th century, it's very hard uh, to reorganize and um, and really free up the resources to do something that is sort of more tailored to the 21st century media environment, which is a, a struggle that every print newspaper or historical legacy newspaper knows is that, you know, the, the print subscribers who still represent bulk of the revenue have very set expectations. And, you know, you have to be very careful about any changes you make that influence that because, you know, that's where the money is. Um, and, and the, you know, the digital operation, which can also involve uh, evolving an identity that maybe is a bit more attuned to some cultural currents that aren't necessarily shared by retirees uh, reading the print product, uh, can also generate some friction. And of course, again, these digital born entrants don't have that challenge uh, because they start from a green field rather than, uh, than rebuilding an existing organization. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rasmus, for sharing your perspective on, on startups, new startups. And uh, I just, on a footnote, I want to um, say that Karen Wall Jorgensen from the Cardiff University just has a recent paper out on origin stories of local journalism entrepreneurs. I posted that in the chat. It's a paper on UK. It's open access so everybody can read. Um, Rasmus, we still have a question in the in the chat, and I will I will read that. Um, so Franco Zotta asks, isn't it a problematic result of the media crisis you described that we get an a, atomized public with many niche offerings? Can a democracy function with such a media system? Thank you. Um, well. Um... I, I think there are many reasons to be concerned, and, and some of them are captured in your question. Um, at the same time, I would add a couple of um, further points. The first one is that um, the idea of a single mass media dominated sort of shared public is a very uh, recent and narrow historical phenomenon that is essentially primarily based on uh, national broadcasting. And to some extent in a few countries, popular national newspapers, which of course, even in a German context, 
apart from Bild, were never really national. They were regional and, and, and metropolitan newspapers, überregional, if they had uh, you know, grand ambitions or were willing to lose money by, by selling their paper in Berlin, in addition to wherever they actually made their money. Um, and, and in that sense, that idea of sort of a single mass public it is essentially something that primarily has to do with a low choice television radio environment. And of course, we should keep in mind, even as we now consider new threats and, and possible risks to democracy and public life, that during the majority of the period in which we had that public, critical scholars and independent journalists thought this was a terrible thing because it, it tended to be sort of dominated by sort of hegemonic, narrow political consensus and, and the interest of proprietors. Uh, I, I don't remember uh, German journalists, uh, uh, sort of media commentators, or let alone media scholars in the sort of 70s and 80s, marching around saying build and 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 you know build and RTL are the best things since sliced bread. Um, it, th I think they had one or two reservations about you know what that would uh, what that represented and indeed what our idea and ZDF represented. Um, so I think there is something that is at risk there, but I think we should remember that that what we had had its own uh, limitations. Furthermore, and this is one of those things I really invite each of us to think about, and it's something I think about myself all the time, is that in a sense, um, a sort of challenges to sort of the fabric of our society that's driven by citizens' right to choose uh, are, are, I think, are sort of particularly challenging to think about from a normative point of view. Um, because if the relative sense of cohesion that is implicit in your question that we had in the past was premised on the lack of choice. And if many people, for example, women or religious minorities or ethnic minorities uh, or sexual minorities may have looked at that cohesion and thought, you know what, that's everybody else telling me how to live my life and what I should believe and not really something that represents and reflects me. Um, how confident are we really describing it as a bad thing when people have more choice and then exercise that choice in a way that yes, does generate a lot of challenges, but is fundamentally driven by, by choices made by citizens uh, that then in turn become structures that shape our future choices. Franco Sota uh, raises another question, which I think directly maybe connects to what, what you just said. He asks, who can play a stronger role in building a new biotope for quality journalism? What do you hope for? Is it government initiatives or is it regulation or is it rather a civil society engagement? Um, I mean, I... I... I try to sort of stick to my lane as a, as a scientist. Um, and I like to think that the analysis that we, that we do um, at the Institute is useful as people make their decisions, but I also try to take care never to tell people how to do their jobs. Um, and that applies to journalists and that applies to editors and it applies to policymakers uh, as well. Um, and, and, and I think it's important that we just, are sort of empathetic and understanding and recognize that sometimes the interests are only partially aligned amongst all of these different players. Um, it's not every journalist who feels that they have sort of a full commonality of interest with their employer necessarily. I think there used to be a phrase for this relationship between capital and labor. Um, and similarly, of course, there are instances where policymakers may be incentivized and uh, to act in ways that are aligned with the ambitions of journalism and news media, but not always. I mean, uh, again, you know, across Europe, arguably politicians are the greatest threat to media freedom uh, in the European Union. Um, so, you know, I've tried to be very clear uh, in my own work that um, I think there are roads ahead for for-profit news media, but it's also important to be clear they require tough choices and we should sort of recognize that there are some of the existing companies that either because of their ownership or the profile of their leadership may decide that they would rather focus on sort of incremental adjustment rather than making those tough uh, decisions. And, and then there will be one set of consequences. And if they made more fundamental changes, then it would work for some and it'll fail spectacularly for others. There are no guarantees. Um, for journalists, you know, I, I, I think everyone has to make their own choice. Some journalists will, will prefer to have the um, relative advantages that comes with staying in legacy media, even though it is growing more precarious and there are real limitations what most legacy media are able or willing to do in a digital environment. Others take the risk and become entrepreneurs or join new ventures. 
um, there are risks and rewards uh, on, on both and no guarantees in either situation. And finally, for policymakers, I mean, I always stress that um, we should be careful what we wish for. And there are some countries in which I think we have reason to believe that policymakers could play a genuinely helpful role in uh, creating a more enabling environment for independent professional journalism. I think Germany is probably one of those contexts. I mean, I think there is sort of a, a broad-based uh, commitment to arm's length principles and, 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 and the sort of principles of free expression um, and, and a, a history of, of um, uh, public intervention in the media market that uh, I think we have sort of reason to recognize as being sort of broadly in many ways benign. And in that context, the, the report that Christopher mentioned that was produced by the Forum for Information and Democracy called the New Deal for Journalism itemize a wide range of policy options that uh, elect that citizens and their elected officials could consider if they want to create a more enabling environment for, for professional journalism. And that's a purely political choice. And my views as a citizen are no more interesting or less interesting than anybody else's, but the options are there. And it is a political choice whether or not uh, 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 they are pursued or not. It, it, that's, uh, that's, that's for democ in, in, in democratic society for citizens and their elected officials to decide whether they want to, whether they think this is important enough to do it. And if they do it, I just hope they read the report because there are lots of idiotic ideas in, in circulation as well. And let's try to not be idiots. That would be, a, that would be helpful. I think the questions from Lucas and Holger really connect to this. Um, I think what they focus on is the question, does innovation funding will help? What is your perspective on innovation policy in, in journalism? Maybe also on the background. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, it's, it's one of the options that we highlight in the report. It's a, it's a tool uh, that's available to policymakers. It's well understood um, that there are limits uh, you know, everyone can sort of go back and look at industrial policy in the 70s for, for a deeper appreciation of how difficult it is to do it right. But it's a tool. It is a tool. And I think there is reason to believe that it can make a difference if it's invested in a way that enhance reskilling of existing journalists, that offload some of the training costs that otherwise have to be carried by existing publishers, and that um, um, uh, hedges against some of the risks that that in, incumbent publishers, in particular smaller ones, uh, will will feel um, uh, makes it um, unattractive for them to invest in, in 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 anything but incremental innovation. So I think there is real potential in that space. And I, while I'm not across the details, I am you know I, I follow with interest the. Um, Bayern Media Lab, uh, for example, uh, I think from memory, there is one in the, the Berlin, Berlin Brandenburg uh, area as well. Um, and, you know, it, it's it's a meaningful initiative. Um, the, the, the one thing I would say to sort of um, uh, sort of um, temper expectations of how far one can go with it is that um, we have to remember that even in this much diminished form, the global newspaper industry is something in the region of a hundred billion dollar a year industry. And if that industry is not investing in innovation and professional development, that's a choice. I mean, and, and there, there will be limits to, to, to uh, how far you can get committing my mom's tax dollars uh, to, to changing that behavior. If the industry itself is not really um, committed to the idea uh, you, even as, of course, many individual companies are very much looking towards the future and rightly so. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on that. So I think we have time for one last question. So if anybody wants to raise a hand, yes, we have uh, Volker Stolz. Please go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to ask you a question concerning the domain. So like science journalism, investigative journalism, or local journalism. Um, and let's focus on, on science journalism as one profession trying to uh, stay abreast this digital uh, uh, revolution. And basically the, the questions that you, you find actionable knowledge for your own life and do some stuff which you didn't know before. How do you see this specialty? Because there is also this science communication. So science is also communicating directly to the public and can invent new formats. Do you see a space there or would you say, well, this is really tough in this, um, let's say journalism about uh, the scientific system in general? Or would you, yeah. yeah. Because, and, and even if you see, at, at least I see a space, for example, 
uh, like investigative science journalism, so inquiring whether science mm -hmm. is doing well or are there some problems. Mm -hmm. Or if you just produce this with high cost, so um, then in the moment you publish the stuff, it will be everywhere basically, and everybody can yeah, yeah. pick yeah. up a scandal. Yeah. So how how could you ever envision? in your perspective? Is, is there a space there or don't you see a space? Thanks, Falker. I'm so glad you asked that question. And if you hadn't, I might have just snuck in a version of an answer at the end, because I realized that what much of what I've said has been more general than specific to science journalism. Um, let me say a few things. I mean, I think the first one is um, one thing I often say to editors and executives, um, in particular those who have uh, an ambition to move towards a sort of reader revenue based model for their digital news offerings, is that it seems to me that sort of simplifying and generalizing impossibly and perhaps irresponsibly, but nonetheless, here I go. Um, one could say that we live in a world in which most white collar professionals know more and more about less and less. And a lot of journalists are forced into a position of being generalists who know less and less about more and more. Now, in the old low choice media environment, that didn't really matter. Um, because if I, as a citizen, uh, you know, wanted to know something about science, I didn't really have very many alternatives to paying attention to, to science journalism carried in the mass media. Now, of course, now we live in a very different world. Um, and people have lots of alternatives, including, as you say, the old PR cliche that every organization is a media organization has become true. And people can go straight to the University of Oxford to learn about the Oxford vaccine uh, rather than rely on on uh, on journalistic uh, editorial coverage of it. And, and I really uh, stress for editors and executives that in particular those that um, uh, that want to cater to sort of an, an upmarket affluent and highly sort of public uh, with high levels of formal education, I think it's quite dangerous for them to um, not address the experience that I suspect many of you may have in your own life as well, and that I certainly have as someone who researches media for a living, which is that a lot of the coverage I read is frankly so poor and, and, and um, often wrong on substance that it leads me as a member of the audience to question whether I can rely on the news about things about which I know nothing. If, if the coverage of the things I know something about are so often wrong or inaccurate or misguided, like why should I trust other coverage? And I think this is a strong case for investment in specialized expertise. Now, science journalism is only one form of that. You can take many different forms, but science journalism is certainly one form of it. Um, in, in terms of the, of the role of science journalism in society more broadly, I mean, I think I'm probably preaching to the converted when I say that um, in addition to playing, I think, an, a really important and valuable role as a translator of science and a, and a way of conveying in, a, in an accessible way uh, to a wider public some of the insights and advances uh, or sometimes regresses of science, of course, there is also, and I say this as a scientist who's proud of the institution that I am part of, science is, an, is a powerful institution in our society. And like every other powerful institution, it should be held to account. And that, you know, it can do some of it itself, but it certainly won't do it perfectly. As again, many of you know from your reporting, uh, it, it's also an institution that merits, in addition to um, uh, interpretation, uh, uh, scrutiny. Um, and I think we see, you know, really good examples of both of those things. And I think for those publishers who want to cater to an upmarket audience, uh, I, I think that's a really valuable part of the editorial offer is to have both real insight. You know, if you read Ed Young at The Atlantic in terms of the pandemic, I mean, it's extraordinary what he did. Uh, I mean, it's exceptional what he did. I'm so full of admiration for his work uh, as a citizen, as a lay reader. Um, and of course, also the investigations that other journalists have had of the shenanigans, frankly, that happens inside of science or, or inside of higher education, which, you know, like every other shenanigan in our society, uh, is something that, uh, that that we are well served by having journalists uh, cover and uncover. Um, and this will never come from universities themselves, I promise you. So keep it up. Great. Thank you so much, Rasmus, for joining us today for the insights for the food for thought you gave us today. So very inspiring talk and discussion. And thanks again for joining us today. So Thank everybody you. is invited to check out science-journalism.eu. 
to see uh, which talks are ahead of us. So join us for the next lectures. We will uh, announce them on science-journalism.eu. So thanks again, everybody, and have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you, everyone. Thank you.